Dr. Repschuk is in Romania. And uh, he's, it's a bit later for him right now, obviously, but uh, he has been, I've been really excited to meet him because he is on the forefront of ozone research here in, in the world. And that's really exciting for somebody like me <laughs> who is um, make, you know, really working on ozone from the veterinary point of view as far as getting training and equipment and everything to people. So I'm really appreciative of you and what you're doing. I haven't known you long, but I really look forward to um, getting to know you more and thank you for being here. Go for it. Well, it's, it's a pleasure for me and it's an honor for me to be here. Uh, yes, we do some research. Uh, research, uh, it's quite uh, expensive. So in this kind of therapies, which are uh, said to be alternative, uh, there's not too, money, too much money invested. But anyway, we try to, to struggle and to do some, something to research more on the animal uh, side, more than uh, the human side. Uh, I will just present you some, some uh, uh, easy research that we've done. And uh, this is regarding, this, this is, this is uh, about wounds actually, about chronic wounds in more species. I said here topical ozone therapy. Uh, okay, I will present the topical thing, but I combined it with injectable as well. So probably this will this won't match exactly the title won't match exactly but mainly it's about topical protocols okay um the effects researched by us were actually ozone promoting chronic wound healing in uh, more species the antimicrobial effect of uh, ozone the topical antimicrobial effect of ozone and then later on uh, the anti-inflammatory effect and uh, maybe ozone activating platelets in PRP. Okay. Uh, actually, we've used, as, I, as I've told you, we've used topical gas exposure as in uh, wound bagging, uh, limb bagging, uh, and uh, infiltrations, paralysional infiltrations. Uh, then uh, we also uh, tried to do some preliminary research or preliminary uh, sampling on PRP-03 or, or PRP, ozonated PRP, and we will discuss about this a bit later. Good. Um, here you have the first the first uh, paper we've, we've done actually on horses. It's actually evaluation of the therapy therapeutic effect of ozone in the treatment of chronic wounds in horses. We had lots of cases with uh, wounds on the, on the distal limb area and uh, they were treated for many, many months in the field by several veterinarians and they didn't heal uh, at all and they, con they got complicated and uh, the owners actually came to, 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 our, to our clinic in the university and we managed to do something with them. Okay, to heal them actually. Um, what was the protocol we've used? Probably it was a bit exaggerated uh, due to the classical protocols. We've used 50 micrograms per milliliter uh, uh, ozone concentration, 30 minutes exposure each 48 hours until complete healing. It was bagging technique, bagging you uh, wound, wound bagging technique or a limb bagging technique. Okay, uh, it worked. Really nice, you will see later on. Uh, some tips, always try to protect the bags. The bags will break in horses. They are not so uh, so uh, obedient as people are to stay with their hands up and the bags on their hands and stuff. Uh, so uh, an, easy, an easy way to protect them is uh, by uh, making a bandage of protection by, with cotton and with, with a bit of vet wrap, it's fine, it's okay. Or for example, we've used something uh, more special. This is uh, uh, in the lower part of the of the of the screen. You will you will see the image on the right. Uh, that's a membrane for artificial vaginas for stallions. It's the disposable membrane from inside. Uh, we use that because it has two openings, and we were able to leave the horse uh, uh, putting weight on his on his uh, on his uh, hoof without any problem use two tourniquets 
to fix it and it's fine. It won't deinflate or the ozone won't come out. Everything is, will be fine. Okay. Um, what we've seen there in the last two thirds of the treatment period, everything expanded like boom, everything was epithelizing. The wounds were really nicely epithelizing. They closed quite quick. Uh, imagine that we had horses that uh, were treated for 14 months in the field. That was crazy. And we managed to close them in, uh, in uh, to close their wounds or to heal their wounds in days. Okay. Uh, it is really interesting. Okay, I will present you some some of the cases because this is the most interesting part. Probably, probably the research and data is more more boring. I will present you some pictures. This was one uh, one mare with a wound, a chronic wound, an old wound at the level of the fatlock, one front limb, and you can see easily see the evolution in 48 days. Uh, it healed in 54 days. There was a lot of uh, granulation tissue at first, but we'd never leveled the granulation tissue. So we never cut it off. Uh, it was healing really nicely. The granulation tissue um, uh, actually disappeared somehow. Uh, we used also um, uh, compressive bandages, uh, compressive dra uh, dressings, and this, this thing helped somehow. Yes, please, Jonathan, you appear there. Just, you have a question. Just, yeah, <laughs> one quick question. So yes, please. you might get to this, but did, have you done the limb bagging at various concentrations and have you seen any difference because- No, okay. I, didn't, I didn't do the bagging for these cases at different concentrations. I did it with 50 micrograms per milliliter. That's why I said it's a bit different than the standard, than the standard protocol. And uh, it worked really well. It wasn't too harmful for the tissues, as you can see. Okay, great. great. So all of your for all of your treatments you've done pretty much at 50 micrograms all the way through the treatment? Yes, because this was the pro protocol we fixed for this study. Okay. So that was it. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, this was one of the cases. Then we had many other cases with the same evolution, good evolution, great evolution. For example, in this case, there was not too much uh, necrotic tissue on the surface of the uh, of the of the wound, but there, were, there was still a bit of fibrin. And uh, at the beginning, when we started treating it, it was it was infected for sure. This one was treated for about five months in the field. There was some uh, some superficial flexor tendon uh, injuries. The deep flexor tendon was touched as well. Uh, the horse, the, the mare, because it was a mare, uh, didn't even put the limb down. She was she was jumping like a like a dog in three limbs. Uh, and after the treatment and after the wound healed, she was okay. She was able to walk normally. She still had some limping uh, signs, but. She was she was able to walk, walk and she was she was walking with her uh, with her owner on her back and it's that's great. Uh, another case this was a bit more interesting was a bit more complicated. Uh, a mare, twenty one years old, something like this. Uh, uh, she was she she got an injury during transport during transportation. Uh, she was treated for this one was treated for 14 months in the field and she developed uh, at this at that level of the pastern she developed a huge uh, exuberant granulation tissue mass uh, we actually removed that mass and it looks uh, it looked uh, immediately after it looked like in uh, picture a and then 67 days of treatment 67 days of treatment and it worked pretty well she she got she got uh, back to work and she was with the owner was very happy uh, another case three years old uh, stallion frisian stallion again traumatic uh, uh, traumatic injuries uh, during transport uh, lots of uh, lots of necrotic tissue all over the wounds uh, they healed in 40 respectively, 56 days, because you have two wounds there. As you can see in the pictures, they evolved differently. Uh, the depth of the wounds was different, and that's why this uh, this uh, difference uh, in healing time. Uh, 
uh, another another stallion, an Arabian stallion, with again with a huge exuberant granulation tissue mass on at the level of the metatarsus. Uh, this stallion was treated for one year, and they didn't they didn't at one moment at one certain moment they said okay we will slaughter this one we cannot do anything because we we just level the wound and level the wound and level the wound and it doesn't heal ever. Uh, yes, it didn't heal because the the mass had already a periostal origin. Uh, the initial wound actually touched the periosteum and it was it was quite massy because we had to remove the mass uh, and it was a quite difficult surgery because we had to resect a bit of the bone of the metatarsus. It was interesting. Okay, anyway, this is why it healed a bit in a, in a bit a longer time, in 91 days. Also, you can see in the first picture that all the surrounding tissues are quite uh, quite interesting, quite uh, messy, quite fibrotic, quite uh, uh, edematous. Uh, they are not really, really nice looking. And this was as well a um, factor to, to prevent uh, quicker healing. So a couple of things, if I can in, in, interject here. So first of all, um, can I don't know if you're going to do this later on in your presentation, but can yes. you walk us through what your protocol is? How, just kind of tell people how you do it. This was just bagging the wound. That was it. Nothing. Tell more. us how to bag. Tell us. Tell us how you bag. What you do. Actually. You actually fix the bag around the, the, the wound. I've I've told you that I've used those uh, um, uh, artificial vaginas uh, vagina uh, membrane for stallions. I used it. I've put it around the uh, around the limb. I've inflated it with ozone until it was hard to palpate. Okay, and left it there for thirty minutes. Okay, so it's fifty micrograms. Yeah. 50 micrograms, 50 micrograms, uh, 30 minutes exposure each 48 hours, okay? Two days at uh, an interval of two days, each second day, let's say. Do you wet the uh, limb first? Do you moisten it at all or do you do anything else? Yes, of course, we did a, we did a, we did a, uh, a usual flushing with saline uh, for, for just uh, removing the fibrin or debris that it was there and that's it. Do you use That's ozonated cool. saline or no? No, I didn't use ozonated saline because I didn't have a bubbler. <laughs> okay. uh, so um, I used just I used just saline, and that that was it. Okay. It yeah. nice. Have you, Have you ever used oils? One of the uh, Cedric asked, "Have you used uh, have, have you ever used ozonated um, fluids with it or oil uh, to help no. healing?" Okay. No, I, I've used it in the clinic, but not in these studies. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good. Another thing that we've actually wanted to check was the antimicrobial or antibacterial effect of ozone bagging in horses with chronic wounds. Okay. Again, the chronic wounds of horses, limb wounds. Uh, we did. We 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 did the same protocol as as we've discussed now with with the Jonathan. Uh, we did the local flushing. We cleaned the wounds before doing the treatment. We did the superficial treatment with maybe some uh, some sterile uh, gauze pads, and we did the microbiological sampling before and after the treatment. Okay, so we did this for two treatment sessions. So um, uh, this way we have a comparison way or a, or a thing to compare with. Uh, actually, we had great results for let's say such a low dose for antibacterial effect because 50 micrograms per milliliter, it's a mid range dose for antimicrobial uh, effect. We had 63.06% bacteria bactericidal efficacy uh, after the first day, after the first treatment and 93.81 after the second treatment. And I think that it's perfect, that it's enormous at such a low dose for uh, antimicrobial e e efficacy. Good. Um, other treatments. I said that I've I've, uh, I've uh, introduced here, even if it is not really topical, 
the ozone subcute injections with ozone for for uh, the ozone subcute injections with uh, in in uh, uh, wounds in chronic wounds in pets in dogs and cats okay so here is a paper we've uh, we've uh, wrote uh it's two case reports two male dogs we've used the uh, this protocol actually subcutaneous 12 15 micrograms per milliliter it, it varied uh, with the with the advancement of the wound stage uh, one two milliliter uh, gas volume inoculated per point uh, of injection and the injection points were were had a distance between them of two to three centimeters we've evaluated it photographically and of course we did some protection damages for this for this uh, patients good the first uh, the first case was a dutch hound a male 10 years old uh, male so it was really old for a dutch hound uh, he had 20 square centimeters wound at the level of the hawk it was really really bad because the, my colleagues tried to treat it for many 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 days uh, he did not respond to the classical treatment um, there was a lot of necrotic tissue around uh, there was a quite a severe infection with the um, with a bacteria which was quite uh, resistant to antibiotics, antibiotics and they said okay we don't know what to do anymore do your do your do your job do your thing here try to fix it and they came with the dog to me and we did uh, infiltrations perilational infiltrations and bagging as well because of the because of the, the, the bacteria present there and you can see that in 16 days a deep nasty wound was completely closed and the, the dog was using his limb normally and everything was fine and the other case it's a german shepherd it was a german shepherd seven years old 400 square centimeters wound on the neck it was a white gangrene which was treated by my colleagues they managed to get it to uh, this stage in picture a and they said okay we want to close this quicker we want to advance a bit with the with the contraction phase and then they came to me and they said okay do your thing and it went really really well we've injected it we just injected perilisionally and you can see that in 46 days it was completely closed mm. wow so quick, quick a few questions for you if that's okay i'm sorry i'm no problem <laughs> um do you when you do the installation do you in you insufflate the bag and leave it there or do you continuously flow ozone into the bag insufflate the bag and leave it there the bag's volume it's huge actually yeah. uh, it has a diameter of about 25 centimeters these bags that i've used so i think it's more than enough for for uh, for that slim uh, limb of a horse okay okay um and and in this the previous i think one was that injection of ozonated saline did you inject ozonated saline in one of those yeah. cases or okay no we didn't inject ozonated saline we've we've just we've just uh, injected the gas as it is a subcute. Uh, next question. Um, yes, Sylvia asks, did any horses get tested for pythiosis? Any experience using O3 for that? No. No. Okay. So not sure. And we might be able to answer some of those questions later on in the Q&A as well. Um, yeah. Were, were antibiotics used in these dog cases at all? Uh, before treatment, yes. Okay. Before, but not, not after you, no, they no, came no, to you. After, after used uh, uh, antibiotics because they weren't efficient as you could see if at, at least in the uh, Dutch hounds uh, case it wasn't they weren't efficient okay all they right and do you have last question do you have do you have any idea what the bags were made of that you were using for limb bagging uh, I think I can remember that it was polyethylene or something like this polyethylene yeah yeah and polyethylene is pretty good actually with o ozone um, so that's yeah. good we, we saw that there was no damage. First, we've tested them because we know that there are some certain materials which will uh, react with ozone, and we've tested it, and it was perfectly intact. No strange smell, no nothing, and we've used it, so it worked. Okay, uh, another case, this was not 
this was not uh, put into this study or case reports. Uh, it was an eight years old husky female with a wet gangrene due to drugs reaction. Yes, it was a drug reaction, but not local administered drug reaction. It was a reaction to some systemical uh, IV um, uh, antibiotics. It healed in 40 days, okay, but not, I didn't want to underline that thing. I wanted to underline that you have there in the last picture a lot of new grown hair just on the line where we've injected the ozone and there's no hair on the other side of the body so it was interesting to me uh, for me to see that uh, actually i think that ozone helped with the regrown uh, regrow of hair uh, in this case it was quite interesting for us to see that okay uh, another case another nice case uh, FIV positive cat, which we did uh, a scapulectomy on, we've, we've amputated the front limb, it was completely compromised. Uh, and it got, the wound got dehissed because of the immunosuppressed animal. Uh, it was really, really nasty. You can see here in the, in the left side of the image, uh, the lower image, uh, the smaller image, uh, the appearance of the wound after 14 days of classical treatment with antibiotics and everything. It was expanding actually, not closing. And we were we all got a bit uh, scared and my colleague said, okay, let's try your thing as well. Uh, let's do it. And uh, we've, we began infiltrating subcute with ozone, just putting there a, a normal dressing, a normal protective dressing. And in 45 days, everything got closed and everything was nice and everything was healed and the cat was okay, was doing fine. Uh, because of many skepticals that said, okay, this was one case, you cannot uh, generalize everything on one case. Yes, of course, I agree with them. But we have here some, some uh, uh, papers written by others. Uh, these were experimental uh, uh, papers or studies on acute wounds, four square centimeter wounds uh, one was just with bandages, they, they, they induced the wounds and they just bandaged. And the other one, the Mitsui um, paper was ampicillin plus bandage. So these were acute wounds. Let's remember this, these were acute wounds. Uh, we had a 40.15 square centimeter wound uh, in a chronic FIV um, cat. So in the first, after the se first seven days, the first study with just bandage, they had 18.3% reduction of the wound surface area. We had 81% reduction of the surface wound area. Uh, uh, done in the second uh, study, in the Mitsui study in day 40. So uh, in day 40, had, they had 92.5% uh, reduction of wound uh, surface and we had 97.2% uh, uh, reduction. So we are talking about acute versus chronic wounds. So those were acute wounds, which will for sure will, will heal quicker. And we were, we were fighting with a chronic uh, wound in a, in, a, in a immunodepressed cat. So it's quite relevant for me, hopefully for others as well. Good. Uh, so in conclusion, we can say that it has great antibacterial surface effects, surface antibacterial effects. It really promotes the contraction phase in, in this cat, at least it really promoted the contraction phase. I could observe that in horses as well in the first, in the first uh, treatment uh, period. The peripheral blood flow, it improves really, really nicely when you pinch with the, with the needle after a couple of uh, treatments, you see that there's a lot of fresh blood coming out thing that does not happen at the first or before the first treatment. Uh, it works really well in immunosuppressed patients, you can see. Uh, good prevention of exuberant uh, tissue uh, uh, growth, of exuberant granulation tissue growth. In those horses which I've presented, I've never leveled the wounds. The, the tissue, the exuberant granulation tissue, which was there at the beginning, just disappeared, just retracted, okay? So that was really, really impressive for me because I've, impressive for me because I've, I've always had to level those 
exuberant granulation tissues with clinic with with, with classic uh, uh, therapies. Okay, but of course we need a lot more clinical trial studies, and these studies are not easy to perform because wounds are not similar. Uh, their depths are not similar. So if you want to do, let's say, a standardized uh, study, you have to induce those wounds. And I really hate doing that. Uh, hopefully we will do uh, we will do more studies on wounds and sporadic wounds. Okay, John, do you have so, some? Yeah, ask? real quick, just on the cat case. Um, so w were you doing bagging again and or was that? No, it uh, was just it was just uh, under uh, uh, subcutaneous infiltrations, perigulation of, ga of gas. Yes, of gas. That okay. Was it. Okay. And what concentration? Uh, Twelve uh, micrograms per milliliter. Okay. And what a do What was the volume that you were putting in? The volume actually it it depended it depended with the with the uh, surface of the wound because the the volume reduced as the wound reduced, because I've, I've said before that we put one, two milliliters per point, okay, per, you know, per uh, uh, injection. Uh, and the injections have two or th up to three centimeters distance between them, perilegionally, okay, perilegionally, around the wound. So this will influence the total volume for sure, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Do you find that, um, they, cat, that they tolerate that okay? Do they tolerate it? This cat tolerated, tolerated it well. I had some cats which uh, uh, which didn't tolerate the infiltration, the injection, actually the pinch, the needle pinch. They didn't tolerate it, but they didn't have anything. Uh, they didn't react uh, weird at the at the inoculation of the, the gas. They didn't react weird at all, even if we know that it's a bit itchy and a bit... Uh, um, unpleasant to have it under your skin mm. at the in the first seconds in the first few seconds but they didn't react at all they were fine they were Great. okay well I'll let you finish your presentation now good um other important facts that we we've, we've seen in our research was the inflammatory anti-inflammatory effect okay and uh, somehow the regenerative effect but this is uh, this is the with with a question mark because uh, it needs a lot of more research a lot more research the thing with the regenerative uh, aspect okay we did a study in rats we've induced uh, septic peritonitis in these rats uh, and treated them with ozone at 30 micrograms per milliliter and 50 micrograms per milliliter concentrations uh, these are the images the histopathological images of of the untreated uh, group okay there's a lot you have in picture a you have a peritoneum in b you have epiplon in c you have some uh, uh, kidney um, tissue and in d you have some liver uh, tissue okay uh, all of them had necrotic surfaces uh, lots of uh, uh, inflammatory um, uh, uh, cells Okay, so there, this was a highly inflammatory uh, uh, picture. Okay, uh, this was the picture, the histopathological evaluation of the um, group with ozone treatment. There were no modifications. Nothing was wrong with these guys. Uh, even if if it was with 30 micrograms per milliliter or even better with 50 micrograms per milliliter, the 50 micrograms per milliliter, per milliliter looked better, looked better. So this was a pneumoperitoneum with gas, uh, uh, with ozone, uh, just just experimental. And it worked really nice and the, the anti-inflammatory effect was quite obvious. Okay, there's another study we've made on, on whole horse blood okay we've drew some blood from the horses and we've treated it with, with ozone at different concentrations you can see them in the table and we've 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 managed to see that uh, platelets dropped really heavily off at 30 50 and especially at 80 micrograms per milliliter concentration okay this gave us the idea of concentrating some dog platelets, okay? Even if they are dogs and they are not uh, horses, 
Uh, but to see if in dogs it uh, happens the same, and it happens the same and happens really nicely. Uh, uh, we've concentrated from 7, 7, 77 plus to 789, and uh, at the after treatment with 50 micrograms of per milliliter concentration of ozone, they dropped at 220. Uh, you can see in the pictures below that uh, the microscopical, microscopical after, uh, aspect uh, before and after the O3 treatment. Uh, in the picture before, you can see there are lots of platelets uh, um, in the field. Lots of platelets uh, grouped there, and in the second picture after the treatment, you can see that there are you can barely see here and there some uh, some platelets. So this puts us a question mark: Does L3 activate PRP? We don't know. Uh, actually, in human medicine, they say it helps with the with the enhance of growth factor release, but does it activate? The PRP. This is a question mark, and we should research it further more. Okay. Um, in conclusion, anti-inflammatory effect. Perfect anti-inflammatory effect. I think this is the reason why the granulation tissue in those horses we've treated did not exuberate. Uh, probably there was an anti-inflammatory, superficial anti-inflammatory effect, and this prevented the the, the exuberant granulation. Uh, and maybe it might quicken the release uh, of growth factors because of activating the, the, the platelets, but more research is needed even in human medicine, okay? They use PRP, ozonized PRP, uh, for, for um, joint infiltrations and uh, traumatic, in, uh, traumatic tendon injuries and stuff like this, sports medicine especially, but we have to prove it really, really well before taking it as gold standard. Okay, I would like to thank you for, for, your, uh, for your attention. And I would like to remember a bit Velio Bocci, okay, who is actually a god, was a god here in, in Europe with uh, ozone, with all his research and stuff. And uh, unfortunately, we've lost him last year. And that's, that's it. This is life. But we have to, we have to uh, take care of his research and to continue it for sure. Yes, agreed. Uh, thank you. Uh, really quick. So we're going to have a break here in a second, but somebody wanted me to go back to one of these slides. Uh, yes. Please. Was it that slide um, or the one after? And then a question, how much ozone would you inject intraperitoneally at 30 or 50 micrograms? One, one milli oh, micrograms, 30 and 50. We had two, we had two groups uh, of study. One was with 30 micrograms and one was, was with 50 micrograms. And the results were, were all, all, almost similar. Uh, the 50 micrograms per milliliter was a bit better as an anti-inflammatory effect than, than the 30 micro, uh, micrograms per milliliter. But they worked both nicely. And okay. I think... I think 30 micrograms per milliliter would be um, the choice, the first choice, because it's a bit less irritative. Okay, it's less irritant. Okay, and did you what gauge needle did you use? Uh, for for you know. for these rats, it was a 21 gauge, I think. Uh, oh, okay, I yeah. Can... Okay, um, yes. and in the dog injections, I think it was the dog ones. Did you inject directly into the wounds at all, or was it around? Around the wound, in one dog, uh, the German Shepherd with a huge uh, cervical, uh, dorsal cervical wound, I've injected the uh, intralesionally. Uh, there was a bit of, uh, of uh, 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 flash lacking. There was a bit of muscular uh, um, missing, of mus muscular chair missing, and we've uh, injected there as well, and it worked really nicely. The granulation tissue leveled everything there, and it was really great good okay okay awesome well excellent there's a lot of people who really appreciate these studies because we don't get a lot of them so <laughs> um that i i really enjoyed this Thank